I am firm in my belief that the anime community has a serious problem with proximity bias. In a world where a sister's all you need only has 128,648 ratings on my anime list, yet a cavalcade of casuals insist that Attack on Titan is the most orgasmic thing they've ever seen in their lives, it's clear that y'all need to watch more anime. Don't get it twisted. For the most part, I enjoy me some Attack on Titan, but it is by no means the GOAT and y'all need to stop pretending it is. Thankfully, Papa Pixelation has seen an unholy amount of anime, and my goal with this video is to recommend your next binge. Let's take a look at some of my favorite anime that most of y'all probably overlooked. These shows might have had a small following when they aired, but the conversation has largely moved on, and I find that to be incredibly sad, and likely illegal in some territories. Don't you just love the trend in anime where things that have no business being waifus are made into waifus? I mean, as good as So I'm a Spider So What was, and as much as I enjoy the lizard side story in Overlord, and as great as that time I was reincarnated as a slime is, you aren't gonna see me trying to put the moves on spiders, lizards, and that three-pound bucket of Nickelodeon mermaid slime. But what about that time the studio behind Mobile Suit Gundam, Code Geass, and Love Live thought... But what if it was fuckable? Enter Classicaloid, an original anime by Sunrise that asked the question, what if Tchaikovsky was a blonde idol who went by the name of Chaiko and was in a duo with famed composer Baderzuska? And then, instead of disregarding the question as something only someone on a bad acid trip would ask, they decided to greenlight it for 50 episodes. I only watched the first season, which might sound weird given that I am including it in this video, but to be fair, I didn't drop it because I wanted to, but rather the second season aired incognito, and while I heard it was coming, I want to say it aired on a platform I didn't have access to at the time, and, well, five years later, I still haven't finished it. It's a series that has an absolutely ridiculous premise, but believe it or not, I remember enjoying it, despite my desire for there to be more of a dramatic plot interwoven with the slice-of-life shenanigans. If you're interested in anime with practically zero stakes, but don't take themselves too seriously, you might enjoy Classic Lloyd. It's a wild, absurd ride, and if you let yourself have fun with it, it could be well worth the binge. Classicaloid is currently available via High Dive. I think it's great when an anime knows what it wants to be from the start and then succeeds in spades. It seems like way too many shows get confused on that, which leads to an unclear direction and a messy finale, even when they're original productions. I'm looking at you, darling in the Franks. In the case of Shuka's 91 Days, it's clear what they're trying to do make a story drenched in influence from The Godfather, Code Geass, and any other creative work involving the Mafia, and a character vying for revenge against the Mafia. And what's more, they do a damn good job. In 91 Days, we follow Angelo Lagusa, who, as a child, witnessed the Venetti Mafia family slaughter his family, but he managed to escape and adopted the new identity of Avilio Bruno. Seven years pass, and Avilio returns to his hometown to infiltrate the family and exact his long-sought revenge, beginning with befriending the Don's son, Nero. I remember thinking that this one was brilliant in its execution, and fully deserving of accolades, but it sort of came and went without much fanfare, which is unfortunate. Its setting reminded me, rightfully, of shows like Bakano. There's something incredible about anime set in the Prohibition era and dealing with the inner workings of the Mafia, and I feel like we need more. Or we could just get more isekais set in MMORPGs, which... <sighs> Let's be real, is probably what's gonna happen. 91 Days is currently available via Crunchyroll. 
I have definitely mentioned before on this channel that certain anime have earned a spot on my watch list based wholly on whether the OP is a bop and a half, right? I was first introduced to Suki Gakire by a compilation of anime OPs from 2017, and every single time I heard this short 20 second clip of its OP, I made a mental note to check it out as soon as possible. But it wouldn't be until early last year that I wrestled control of my brain from the Sentai squad of squirrels who have laid claim to it and finally watched this one over the course of a month because attention span no work the way it should. Suki Gakide is a character-driven romantic drama that follows middle school students Akane Mizuno and Kotaro Uzumi as they discover who they are in relation to the people around them, while they also start to explore the concept of romance and how god-awful they are at it. In fact, I remember this one being kind of refreshing because, for the first time, we have an anime where the characters act like they're adolescents in middle school with all of the emotional and social baggage that comes with it. It's also jam-packed with a significant amount of Japanese culture that seems to be lacking from other, more geographically vague anime. And by that I mean one of the main characters is directly involved in the performance of traditional dance and festival music accompaniment, which is something I have never seen represented in the same way that it is here, and I find that fascinating. I also like that while the ending leaves little to no chance for a second season, it wraps things up remarkably well for a single core anime. I think, aside from Snafu, this is the series that puts Studio Feel on the map for me. It's well written, well animated, well, with the exception of a few shoddy examples of CG crowds anyway. And I would definitely recommend it to anyone looking for a beautifully executed, realistic take on adolescence. Suki Gakire is currently available via Crunchyroll. I struggle to understand how a meta-series about a bunch of otaku discussing and creating anime that ultimately devolves to the point where anime tropes begin taking over the world in a plot twist reminiscent of Star vs. the Forces of Evil's finale ended up so good, but it really was fantastic. It aired in the same year as Gamers by Pine Jam, and I could see some calling it the other side of that coin. The biggest difference is that it's an original, self-contained story with a beginning, middle, and end, which is a big deal when we're talking about anime, as much as I hate to admit it. Anime Gatari centers on Minoa Asagaya, who is by no means your typical otaku. In fact, I would argue that she's a blank slate character meant to represent the part of the audience who might not be super well acquainted with the medium, as a lot of the series involves her learning about the production and fandom of anime, to the point where the third episode is primarily about the three-episode rule. In her school's anime club, there's the Ojo-sama, the light novel elitist, the Chunibio, and the seeming normie who is a closet idol aficionado with a dark past, and they're all joined by a talking cat nicknamed Neko senpai who serves as an anime guide for both Minoa and the audience. I really enjoyed this one as it aired. Its unique twists on a familiar theme make it stand out among the greats of its season, which is saying a lot considering how many absolute bangers aired back then. If you decide to give this one a shot, keep in mind that nothing is as it seems and no matter how you feel about the early episodes, do your best to watch until the end. As I said, it's a meta-series that does a complete 180 in the last quarter, and that's all I'll say about that. Anime Gatari's is currently available via Crunchyroll. I remember thinking as I started Comic Girls that there was something special about it that I couldn't put my finger on. In a world where the slice of life genre has, at times anyway, felt overly crowded, this one taps into what makes the genre great. It's a truly original series that, by the end, will make you feel like you've always known these characters, like years later you're still rooting for them. 
Comic Girls follows a small group of innovative high schoolers as they improve their craft whilst living in an all-female dorm for manga creators. There's Kaoruko Moeta, an unpopular mangaka who's the spitting image of Natsuki from Doki Doki Literature Club, Koyume Koizuka, a shoujo mangaka who experiences difficulties drawing boys, Ruki Irokawa, an arrow mangaka who originally wanted to make manga for children, and Tsubasa Katsuki, a shonen mangaka with a boyish appearance who ends up being the target for other women's affections. In the series, we see these characters navigate their youth while also improving at the art they're so passionate about. To properly illustrate how much this series means to me, I want to highlight one particular scene that will always stick with me. I can't recall what episode this scene occurs, but the basic premise behind it is this. Koyume, the shoujo mangaka, tells Tsubasa, the shonen mangaka, that while she's happy that she is chasing her dreams, she sometimes doubts that she'll ever be popular. Tsubasa then tells Koyume that it doesn't matter if she's popular, what matters is that she keeps chasing her dreams. I saw this episode at the perfect moment. It's something I've had to tell myself many, many times in the last few years, and it's something I am still trying to master four years later. If you have ever had to tell yourself that it doesn't matter if anyone digs what you have to offer, that it only matters that you're making stuff, I highly encourage you to watch Comic Girls. It's a brilliant series that has sadly gone unrecognized. Comic Girls is currently available via Crunchyroll.